<laughs> okay. Yeah, let us pray. Um, all right. Shabbat shalom, everybody, my brothers and sisters. Let us pray. Let's commit this time to the Lord and uh, let's dive into his word. Come. Heavenly Father, we just want to want to acknowledge your presence. We want to honor you. We want to welcome you. And that uh, we pray, Lord, by your Holy Spirit and the ministry of your word, this afternoon you will lift up your children. You will equip your beloved ones. You will empower your people to be able to live triumphant lives that relay and reveal your glory for such a time as this. Thank you, God, for equipping us to be made usable by you, Lord, to reach our generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, this afternoon for blessing our time together in your presence. Thank you for the flow and the deluge of light and revelation, Lord. Thank you for working in our life, in our hearts. Thank you for revealing your glory through our ministry. Thank you, Lord, for all of this. In the wonderful name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Well, uh, Brothers and sisters, welcome to part two. Welcome to part two of this uh, two-part series. Uh, I, I'm on this subject of COVID-19 and the end time shaking. And uh, today we're gonna we're coming to the part two. Part one, we saw a little bit of uh, the background and, and, and the origin of the pandemic and uh, who might be the people behind it and how we should uh, how we should protect ourselves from the fear that the enemy is wanting to, to produce, wanting to create through this. And it is actually created for them to, to power grab, actually. All right, so we must not play into the hands of the, of the wicked one. And this is a time that God wants us to seek him more than ever before, you know, that he has something that he's something divine he's doing in our life, even in our life, even in our church and ministries in this, in this very momentous hour of uh, history. The COVID-19 pandemic certainly is the biggest global crisis since World War II. And this is without doubt. All right? We have never seen um, such a, a, a lockdown of the whole world, actually. Um, uh, and the economy of the world shut down. And I... I shared uh, briefly in my first session how uh, the Lord says this COVID-19, while it is of the enemy and it is intended for harm and evil, God is also using it to achieve something. And God said, I'm using this to be my little burning bush, to get the attention of my people. And then if they will give me the attention, it will be the, the, the beginning of the decoupling of my people from the bondage of the world. And that is referring to the burning bush that Moses, that caught Moses' attention, right? And when, and, and the Bible says, and, and he turned and he looked at the, at the burning bush. And that was the beginning actually of the, of the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. And we know that Egypt is a, is a type of the world. It represents the world allegorically, prophetically, and allegorically, it, it represents the world. The Israelite represent God's people. Pharaoh represents Satan, you know. And in Moses' encounter with the Lord, it it will begin the epic journey of the deliverance of the Israelites from their bondage in Egypt. And so I believe that in this COVID nineteen, you know, God is also uh, wanting God is wanting to use it to capture the, the attention of His people and to begin to to tune into Him and to allow him to deliver us and decouple us from the bondage of the world that we might be able to serve him accurately with reverence and awe, right? We read that in the last session in Hebrews chapter 12, talking about the, the shaking of the, of the end times. All right? and, and, and we believe that this COVID-19 is the beginning, is, it, it marks a, the, the, the beginning of the end time shaking that affects the whole world. It profoundly, uh, it has affected the whole world, and so, and so it is. It is no doubt the biggest global crisis since World War II. And I still remember that. Um, I still remember that in the early uh, part of this COVID nineteen, in sometime in uh, 
in March, uh, while I was praying with some uh, prophetic intercessor uh, over this situation, and, and the, the, these intercessors, they, they all concur that the instruction of the Lord for the intercessory group, and later on I will find out that it's the same instruction to multiple intercessory group, and that was that uh, God was instructing that, that we would pray that the pandemic death rate would, would turn the corner at Passover. And that was in March, it was obviously before the Passover. And there was like no end in sight, you know, the curve was just going up, 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 you know, and, and people were dying. And yet the Lord's instruction to, to the various intercessory teams at that point uh, was, was to apply the efficacy of the Passover so that it would turn, this whole thing would break and it break its stride and it would turn, it would turn at Passover. And, and uh, I would like to show us uh, the chart uh, of the Passover because it came, it came to pass. And COVID, the, this is the, from the Wordometer. Everyone can access this, all right? And this is the latest up to today. And, you, and, I, and it came to pass that it turned the corner at Passover. It's interesting to note that Passover this year Passover this year was, uh, uh, the Passover was April 8. April 8, you know, it's a one week uh, celebration uh, in Israel from April the 8th to April the 16th. And you know what, exactly to the dot on April uh, 16 was the peak of the Passover. And then the whole thing had a sharp turnaround and it began to come down. All right. And since then the, the death rate has been, has been, uh, uh, lower than the point of the, the, the peak, and it is, uh, it is going down, all right? And so we know that this is, uh, we know that this is very, very significant. It's very significant because it shows that, it shows, first of all, the efficacy of, of Passover, the meaning and ramification of Passover, that the redemptive work of our Lord Jesus is what breaks the strike of this, of the strike of this uh, um, global global uh, pandemic, right? And, uh, and what is uh, noteworthy is the fact that it makes Passover 2020 uh, a global Passover. It makes it a global Passover. Uh, because this is the first Passover since the first one 3,500 years ago, when the whole world, whole world was uh, uh, observing Passover, whether they like it or not, knowing or not, they were observing Passover by hiding at home and waiting for the death outside to pass them over, which was the, what happened at the first Passover observed by the Israelites. That was a quarantine of the whole nation of, is, of, of uh, uh, the whole empire of Egypt, actually, and those who believed the warning of the Lord and who would observe the Passover by hiding in the house with their family and shutting the door and letting the plague pass by, they, they, they were protected from the, the plague. All right, so today I want to I um, uh, zoom in on this subject of the Passover because of an encounter I had with the Lord uh, this year uh, over this Passover season. Uh, because a month after, I remember that uh, after Passover, uh, uh, about a month after, I was still having the Passover on my heart. I felt like the Holy Spirit was was uh, talking to me about Passover, which was a strange thing. It, it felt like, I think preachers will understand this, uh, it felt like a message was brewing in my heart on the theme of Passover. And that was already a month after Passover. I, that year, I did not preach on Passover. I mean, this year, all right, the Passover. Usually, every year at the feast day, I would, pe I would preach on the feast day, all right? I love Israel. I preach on Israel a lot, all the time in my church. And then, but this year, I did not because of COVID-19 and the scheduling of the speaker, and I did not get to preach on Passover a weekend. So, I did not preach on the Passover. So, weeks after Passover, I was still feeling like a message about Passover was brewing in my heart. And uh, that was a strange feeling. It was like, it's, uh, it was like, Mm, it was like this feeling to preach about Christmas sometime in February, you know, that kind of a feeling. And so I kept suppressing it. I kept pushing it over when I keep hearing the Holy Spirit whispering about Passover. I kept putting it aside, putting it aside because I thought, well, Passover has 
Passover, you know, I'm not going to preach about it. It will be strange, you know. And then I struggled with it until sometime in about uh, er, uh, early May, I, I yielded, all right. It was one month transpired, four weeks transpired before I yielded and said, are you talking to me about Passover? Because Passover is over, Lord. You do know that, right? And and then the Lord, and then uh, I finally sought God over this. Uh, uh, I sat down and I said, Lord, are you just talking to me about Passover? And you know what? That was when He caught my attention. And when I finally sought Him, uh, it became clear in my heart that. That, that this feeling was actually the whisper of the Holy Spirit speaking to me about something in the Passover. And uh, you know what he was saying to me? He said this to me. He said, there is a key in the Passover that makes all plagues pass over your family. Now that got my attention. So what he was wanting to talk to me, I was a little dull, right? It took me three, four weeks to realize he was wanting to speak to me on the subject of Passover. He wasn't just wanting to give me a message to preach about Passover, which I kept pushing it away. Or he wanted to talk to me about Passover. And he said, I want you to have the key. I want you to know what is this key that makes all plagues pass over. You know, not, and, 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 and that jolted me. It jolted me and made me, uh, it made me dove into the book of Exodus to reread again the account of the, uh, the account pertaining to the Passover, pertaining to, to the Passover as experienced uh, by the Israelites. And then I discovered that key. You know, I, I, it took me uh, a while. <laughs> I kept re, uh, reading and reading, rereading Exodus chapter 11, uh, Exodus 12. And then when I saw that, when it was an aha moment for me, it was such an encounter for me. I began to tremble. I literally began to tremble. And, and my heart was just a uh, kind of like pounding, and, and I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed with joy, uh, and, and, and I was also overwhelmed with the amazement how I missed this. I missed this about the Passover, I, though it's a subject that I, I thought I, I, I had been very familiar with, a subject I've been preaching on for years. And, and so here I am, wanting to share this key with you. So are you ready to receive the key that makes all plagues pass over your family? And so I want to I want to pray again, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you come and and show us this key, and and that and that you will by your grace help us use this key in such a way that no plague will ever come near our life, nor even our whole household. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for making this real to us by revelation through your Holy Spirit right now, in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. And so I want to right now invite you to go with me to the book of Exodus because we are going to find out what was God's instruction for the Israelites to overcome the ultimate plague, which was the tenth plague that befell Egypt, uh, which was, and the tenth plague, tenth plague was the angel of death passing through the whole land and slaying every firstborn in every household, man and beast. Now that was that was the worst plague of all, right? And the instructions of the Israelites to prepare for the last plague begins in chapter 11, verse 1. And, then, and I'm going to bring you there right now. Chapter 11, uh, verse 1. Okay, I'm going to read to us chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, you don't mind, let me take a seat of water. Exodus 11, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Moses, One more plague I will bring on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out from here completely. And so God spoke of one last plague that would take place, the ultimate plague that would free the Israelites from hundreds of years of cruel bondage and slavery under the Egyptians. And God was about to teach the Israelites to partner with him in such a way that they would experience such a mighty and awesome deliverance from that plague. And over and above it, they would come through it blessed, actually stupendously blessed. And so it, it would be the, the biggest turnaround they would ever experience 
in their lifetimes, if not for hundreds of years of their sojourn uh, in, in Egypt. And so God began to give them instruction, which is what I want you to, to lay hold of, all right? What is the key? The key is embedded in the instructions that God gave the Israelites. It's a powerful key. God gave them instruction, first of all, that every one of them, the day before their great deliverance, they would to ask of their Egyptian masters for articles of gold and silver. And God promised them he would put a supernatural favor upon them such that the Egyptians could not refuse their request, but gave to them everything they asked for, such that before evening came, the supernatural compensation would, compensation for all their years of slavery has already taken place before evening. And they, they have just, and they would, experience the greatest transfer of wealth in their lifetime. And that would mean also supernatural provision. So the supernatural favor would be followed by supernatural compensation, which, which would bring about the supernatural provision for the journey ongoing. All right. And all these, guess what? They have taken place just by their preparing for the Passover and not even the Passover yet because the key of Passover has already started to unlock supernatural blessings to them just by their preparation to use it, just by the preparation to carry it out. And so God told them that starting from midnight, the, the very fateful evening, starting from midnight, the angel of death would begin going through the land, slaying all the firstborns through the night. When it's all over by dawn, the Israelites will be found to be so supernaturally protected that it would be their distinction from the Egyptian. And so that would bring in also another supernatural blessing. It is supernatural protection and deliverance that makes them distinct from the Egyptian. And so the scripture uh, is, is in verse 7, that you may understand how the Lord makes how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. There's a distinction. Just like there's going to come a distinction upon your life in the plagues and the shaking up ahead, it will be so obvious to the world that you are supernaturally protected. That is our distinction as God's people in the midst of the, of the calamities that will come upon the world. Amen? And, and, and that means that Israel while they would experience all these stupendous blessings that God promised them from the supernatural favor, supernatural compensation, supernatural provision, a supernatural distinction, while they experience all of this that evening, conversely, on the other hand, the Egyptians would suffer the death of their firstborn as judgment. Wow. So while the Passover brought blessings to the Israelites, it brought judgment. It brought judgment upon the Egyptians, their cruel slave masters. And so God said that through all of this, God said that through all of this that would happen within the 24-hour stretch from before Passover to after, he would be glorified in the land. He would reveal his mighty glory. If the Israelites would carry out uh, uh, what he instructed them to do. And so this is uh, uh, recorded in verse 9 now in Exodus chapter 11, so that my wonders will be multiplied in the land of Egypt, that God would glorify himself if, if the Israelites would do exactly what he told them to do. So I summarize now uh, right here, what were the blessings God has promised them if they would observe the Passover in the specific ways as instructed by God, and, there, and therein lies the key. All right, so first of all, let's look at a summary of what would be all the blessings, all the stupendous blessing, all right? Supernatural favor, right? God promised them. Supernatural compensation and restoration, which we saw in the scripture that took place. Supernatural provision and the transfer of wealth. Now, if you know the same key, you will experience all of this as well. This is the whole idea, all right, the whole, whole focus of this message. Supernatural protection from all the plagues, including the ultimate one. 
supernatural deliverance from bondage. They will be delivered. They will, remember just now we read the scripture, God said, they, you will leave Egypt completely. Eventually now you will leave. And because in the final play, it was the last straw that broke the camel's back, so to say, and, and finally the Israelites would be completely free after they carry out this Passover in a specific way. And then, and then the sixth blessing was supernatural distinction from the world. Their life was so supernaturally blessed, their protection is so miraculous that there is their distinction. There is, it is their distinction. And then, uh, and then God would be glorified through them. Would you want God to be glorified in and through your lives? I want to. So you, you and I must lay hold of this key of the Passover. And the next one is judgment upon their enemies. So it is, it is not just a defensive act. This key is actually, it is an offensive act as well. It brought judgment. While they are observing all of this in the safety of their home, that the judgment was falling upon their enemies, upon the forces that oppress them. And this is what you're going to experience in the days ahead after discovering this key. All right. And then the next blessing is freedom to worship and serve God. We know that it was because of, of the, the, the Passover that finally Israel was free. And their, and their demand to Pharaoh came to pass when God demanded through Moses to Pharaoh, let my people go that they may worship me. Other translations say they may, that they may serve me. This corresponds with Hebrews chapter 12 that we read in the last session where, about the shaking, all right, that everything that can be shaken will be shaken and only that, can be sh that cannot be shaken will remain. And this is what which cannot be shaken. My kingdom, my people, it says they will receive from my kingdom that cannot be shaken. So let them be thankful and to serve me, or in other words, just say to worship me is the same word there, with reverence and with awe. So in all this shaking, actually it is God decoupling his people from bondage to the system, that they, that they may be free to worship and to serve him. Likewise, in all this shaking that has already taken, started to take place right before our eyes, and in the shakings up ahead, God is in God is using all this shaking actually to free his people, not to harm his people. And that's why if we do not know God's plan in these last days, we will, we will be given over to fear just like the rest of the world, not knowing that it is something divine that is taking place in the midst of all of this. And this is one of the many things is that God is, is freeing us, freeing us from, from, freeing us from bondage to the world to be able to serve him accurately to be able to worship him with freedom all right and so this was what took place and with that i'm going to bring you back to the scriptures to see what were the instructions of god for the israelites all right this instruction that were were, were god's uh, 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 wisdom for the israelites that they would experience all these blessings we just uh enumerated just now, all right? They would exp experience all these supernatural blessings if they would carry out the instructions God told them to execute that evening. Beginning with Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, God's instruction was this, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. So, this instruction from God were given to them to carry out as a household, as a family, not individually. All right, now this is where the key begins. It's to be done as a family. And the actions to be taken were to be led by the father of each household. It is, it is implied here, all right, the father or the leader of the family uh, was to lead this whole procession of actions. So each family, every family, uh, I'm going to paraphrase now so that we don't have to read through the whole chapter. Every family was to be gathered, first of all, with their household, be at home, shut the door behind them. They were then to to uh, have a uh, uh, an unblemished lamb 
to slaughter an unblemished lamb and apply his blood on the doorpost and, the, and on the lintel of their house, or right, on the side as well as on the top. And they would eat the whole lamb already dressed up, very unique instruction, already dressed up and packed up and ready to leave Egypt. Like it is going to be so powerful, really, that it will come to pass. Finally, after hundreds of years, they, upon the execution of this, this instruction, they will find complete and total freedom. All right, they were to eat it in that faith. And so this was what exactly what they did. And so in, in verse 13, I'm going to read to you verse 13 now. Uh, the blood shall be a sign for you on the house where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And so this was the action they were to carry out. They were to take the blood of the lamb that they have just slaughtered. And they were to apply it. And because of the application, they will experience the deliverance from all harm. All right? And so this is how it looked like. The Israelites applying the blood on the lintel, on the doorpost. And while they were doing all of that as instructed of the Lord, in the safety of their houses, the plague came through as what God warned, and it brought death to every Egyptian household who did not believe, men and beasts alike. And that was what they, as whole households, whole households, experienced on that night of the, the eventful first ever Passover in human history. God has instructed them ever since to continue observing the Passover as whole families for all generations to come without end. It has to take place forever and ever. They must not stop doing this. And so that is to be a permanent ordinance, the Lord says. All right, so let me read to you from the scripture again. Exodus chapter 12, verse 14. Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. And that's why up to today, until today, the Jews still celebrate the Passover, remembering God's deliverance of them every year, eating the Passover meal, which they call the Seder meal. Right? Until today. They still do it. It's been 3,500 years. Every year at Passover, every Jewish family that believed in, in God would, and, and would express their gratitude and their thankfulness. They would come together. They would eat their, their Passover meal. And this is the, today called the Seder meal. And you will notice that in this Seder meal, a very key element here, we will not go through all the other elements, which I'm sure you have been taught over and over again. Everything actually pointed to the redemptive work of our Lord Jesus. All right? Uh, uh, the bitter herb and all of that including uh, uh, the, the unleavened bread, you will notice that, has, that is striped, that is pierced, that is burned. It, it represents how the, the coming Messiah, their Savior, he would be wounded, he would be pierced, and the wrath of God's, uh, uh, of God's uh, the heat of God's wrath would, would be exhausted upon him against the sin of all of all mankind. And that's represented by the burnt marks. All right, and unleavened because he's a man without sin. That bread represents him, uh, the coming Messiah at that point was the future Messiah. And then the cup representing the blood that would be shed on their behalf, right? So that's the Seder meal. Today, we Christians, we too observe this, this covenant meal. And we observe it with, with greater understanding that it actually points to the finished work of Christ, the Messiah. We Christians, with the revelation of the Passover actually depicting the redemptive work of our Lord Jesus Christ, we would just, we would, we would, we don't just celebrate it once, once a year, like, like what the Jews do. We celebrate it actually every week. 
generally speaking, every week in church uh, uh, is a celebration of the of the redemptive work of the Messiah, and and we eat the Passover meal that we refer to as the Holy Communion today. And today we're going to take the Holy Communion together again. All right. In fact, with such a revelation that it really points to the finished work of our Lord Jesus, we don't have to limit ourselves from celebrating Him and His salvation of us only once a week. We can actually celebrate Him every day, for that matter, as often as we want. That's what our Lord Jesus said to us about the Holy Communion. He says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do this in remembrance of me. Isn't that so? And that's why, and that's why we know that the Holy Communion actually is the, is the parallel to the Seder meal, to the, whole, to the covenant meal that the Israelites have been taking, that God instructed them to do as a permanent ordinance, we do it not just once a year, we do it as often as we can because there's no limit to how much we want to celebrate the redemption that we have and, and is wrought about by, by our Lord uh, and Savior Jesus Christ. And so therein is the key in the Passover and that we can use this key as often as we can, as often as we want, every day, even every moment that we want. So what is this key? I want, to, I want to challenge you right now. All right, with that, I will stop the sharing of the, of the slide for a moment. All right, and, and so I want to ask you, what do you think is the key in the Passover that made the ultimate plague pass over and unlocks all the blessings associated with that first Passover 3,500 years ago. And now it is still within access. In fact, it is more within our access today who are in Yeshua, who knows what it truly means. We, all the more we have this key. And all the more, as often as we, as we want to, we can exercise it, we can use it to experience all this stupendous blessing. How many of you are, are guessing right now that are you referring to the Holy Communion? <laughs> the answer is no. It is the Holy Communion is only just a part of this key. So let us recall what God told the Israelites to do and consider its metaphoric application in our lives, its allegorical meaning for us as believers in Yeshua, believers in Christ. Right? What, what were those instructions? Recall them, those things that God told them to do. First of all, it was something to be done as a family, not individually. Come together as a whole household in the house. Close the door behind you. God's going to bless you as a household, as a family, right? What else? What else did God tell uh, tell him, tell them to do the Israelites. I want you to see the allegorical parallel in our life today. That we, the way that we are to uh, experience and exercise it as well. Do this as a family involving every member, with the father of the household leading it. You see, with the with the parent leading it. And and we are to observe. Imagine the whole family observe, observing the slaughter of the unblemished lamb. The whole family observing it while daddy did this. You imagine that the first time it was being done, you think the family will be away doing their own thing, the kids playing computer games. I'm just joking. There's no computer then. All right. It's the whole family doing it, led by the father, and every member is part of it, observing it, which is a prophetic picture of how we, as a family examine the redemptive work of Christ because the death of the lamb is, the, is, is an allegory, a, a prophetic symbolism of the coming Messiah and how he would die on our behalf. It's the redemptive work of Christ. And not only that, as a family, we are to eat the whole lamb. The Lord told them, eat the whole lamb. Don't leave any part behind, which is a picture of how we are to eat the whole council. The whole word of the Lord, we do know that Jesus Christ is the Lamb, and He also is the Word of God. 
Bible says in the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came, came into being, being by Him, and apart from Him, nothing has come into being at, that has come into being. Or I'm referring to Jesus as the expression of God, the word of God. And, and, and the, as a family, we have to eat the whole lamb. That means we are not partially, we have to receive the full counsel of God as represented by Christ, in whom is the fullness of God's deity, and, and, we are, and we are to do this as a whole family. We are not to be just eating only a, a certain doctrine, a favorite doctrine, we'll eat it over and over again. No, no, no. Eat the whole council. That's what God is saying through this act you know, of the families eating the whole lamb. All right. And then also, uh, I just want to slip in this bit. You know, God said, if you cannot finish the whole lamb, then join with other households. So you can join with other households in this act of eating the word of God, taking in the full counsel of the, of, of the word of the Lord. All right. Then also, they were to eat the lamb and the unleavened bread representing the covenant meal and, and taking that wine, which is the Holy Communion today. I'm still talking about the allegorical expression today, the, the parallel today. We have to take the Holy Communion again as a whole family. That's why the Holy Communion is only a part of this whole key. Where in the Holy Communion, we know the bread represents the body of our Lord Jesus, broken for our healing, and the cup represents His blood shed for our redemption. And we take this as a family. Not only were they supposed to eat of the covenant meal that evening, they were also to apply it. They were to apply the blood on the doorpost and on the lintel in order to be able to experience the full effect of God's promise, salvation, and blessing. So do you see the direct correlation? Just like today, God wants us as a family not only to eat the word and to receive the full counsel of the Lord, Daddy leading this all, and, and, and us taking Holy Communion as a family. We must also apply it in order to experience and receive and of the full of the promises of what God has given us in the redemptive work of Christ on our behalf. If you don't apply the word, you don't experience the efficacy of his redemptive work. It's, it's like what the Bible says, to be the doer of the word and not just the hearer. Amen? Amen. And the Israelites were told to eat the meal all dressed up. Remember? All dressed up packed up, ready to leave Egypt. What is that? What does that mean for us today? It is a picture of us eating the Holy Communion with full faith of its immediate efficacy of delivering us from all our bondage. So we eat the Holy Communion with full faith of what it points to as the redemptive work of Christ and the fullness of of what he has redeemed for us in dying for us on the cross, in his full redemptive work for us through the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. So by now, you see what is the key? Would you want the chance, uh, a guess of what is this key that is supposed to be practiced by us today that will, that will cause us, that will cause us to lay hold it is the family altar, the key of the, that is in the Passover, is the setting up of the family altar. God's ultimate strategy for his people to stave off the ultimate plague is actually the family altar, or what we more commonly refer to today as the family devotion. God's instruction for the whole Passover is actually the setting up of the family altar. Why is, how does that look like today? I tell you people, you will be blessed if you hearken to the voice of the Lord uh, in this hour, because right now, while the family is in a, in a state of, of lockdown, in various degrees of lockdown, is the moment to apply this more than ever before while you still have this kairos moment to re-establish your family altar the family is about the family gathering in the home praying and worshiping together as we examine our lord jesus and his glorious redemptive work 
the father of the household, leading in the reading of God's word, examining his redemptive work, which is actually the gospel. The redemptive work of Christ is actually the good news of Jesus Christ. His death, burial, resurrection, and what it means for us as believers in Yeshua, right? And, and not just that, the whole household eating the word, examining the lamb, discussing, giving the glory to God, finding application of the truths that we are learning as a family. You must find application and partaking of the Holy Communion as a family, believing in its immediate power and blessing, doing it as a household. If you do this, you are the ones that will, that will experience all those blessings all those blessings that the first family altar released upon the Israelites 3,500 years ago, and God tells them to continue to do this so that they would continue to experience all these blessings generation after generation, all right, without truncation in their heritage of the faith. Let's look at, uh, let's look at, now let's relook at the blessings right now in the light of this revelation of what the family altar releases upon the household if we would observe it as instructed of the Lord. You will notice, you will notice just now, I have shared nine blessings. Actually, there are more. There are, there are two more I want to add in right now. All right, and I, and I want to reiterate number eight again. Judgment upon their enemies is actually a proactive thing, all right? It's an offensive act. It's not just a defensive act. Do you know just having a family altar, all right, causes judgment to fall on your enemies without you fighting it because the battle belongs to the Lord? This is the hour to protect your family more than ever before. I'll come to that in a while. Because the family is under attack right now. Do you know that? Do you know that in this pandemic season, more divorces have taken place over these last few months than years added together? Do you know that? You know, I just was uh, talking with a, 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 a uh, um, fellowshipping with a brethren, a practicing lawyer. Uh, it's a sister in Christ. She said, I cannot handle the number of cases of divorces uh, have just gone through the roof. You know, and she said, I cannot even manage all of those cases right now. Just over the last few months, family is actually under attack. The enemy is so insidious and subtle in his attack. You, in the guise of the chaos, um, in the smoke screen of the chaos of the pandemic, he's destroying marriages and families. Do you know that? Do you know people that, do you know that, that uh, 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 children, are leaving the household. I just read in the papers last week that uh, adult children, while trying to work from home, uh, are com they are coming into such strife and conflict with their parents. They are moving out. Many are looking for accommodation to move out to because of their strife and conflict with their parents. That caught my attention of the many, many destruction that um, all kinds of destruction that the pandemic has inflicted upon families, or on society at large, mental wellness deteriorating, business collapsing, all these are tragic. But what particularly caught my attention is the fact that family and marriages are destroyed en masse, you know, much more than our health having been affected directly by the pandemic. It's our family and marriages. And this corroborates with, with this uh, uh, word of the Lord back in March, uh, back in, in, in April, over the past, over there. Protect your family. Families under attack right now. And the people of God are not aware of that. And this is the moment to lay hold of the, the God-appointed season to protect your family and set your family up to be able to withstand all the coming plagues that are up ahead. And it is the family altar. The family altar. Another blessing that I want to add to this list right now is this. Blessing number 10. That faith, if you would to hold the family altar, faith will be passed down to your future generation. All right? Faith will be passed down to the future generation. How do we know? We learn this from how God instructed the Jews that at every Passover celebration, during the Seder meal, the young child of the family 
often the youngest one, is to ask the father every year while celebrating uh, the Passover in the midst of the Seder meal, the young child is to ask daddy all over again, Papa, why is tonight, or Abba in their language, right? Abba, why is tonight different from all other nights? And then the father is to recall the mighty acts of God's deliverance and salvation of Israel from the tyranny of and the destruction of Egypt. The principle here is that during the family altar, which we are supposed to do as often as we can, all right, we parents are to always bring to mind and remembrance and testify to our children of God's reality, love, power, faithfulness, through recalling the acts of God that we have ever experienced in our lifetime. And so that that it will build the faith of our children in God for themselves and, and that will cause them to receive of the inheritance of our faith. That is what is the effect of, this, of the Passover celebration, of the family altar to be exact. If we would observe this today, our family, we will see our faith pass from one generation to the next without being broken, without being broken. And that is what God wants for our family. And not only that, I want to add another blessing uh, to, the, to the family altar as exemplified by the Israelites, all right, is that it sets us up to receive our inheritance. Because at the first Passover, not only it freed the Israelites from Egypt, it sets them up to be able to ahead for Canaan, their inheritance. Finally, this was the final plague, the final act of God, which they cooperated with God to do this series of things. And you know what? They finally experienced all their promised uh, deliverance, salvation, and be set on a path towards the fullness of their inheritance, which was Canaan, which was Canaan. And so this is, is what God is saying to his people in this hour right now. Build the family altar. I can't emphasize this more because over the last few months, it's been four months now I've been preaching to this to many, many nations. I think I preach this to more than 20 nations of this thing that God, this, this uh, uh, instruction from the Lord for his people all over the world, build the family altar. It not only will protect you in this plague, it will protect you from all other plagues to come. It is God's deliverance of the whole household. I am very, very convinced that a major thing that God is doing right now in the midst of the COVID-19 lockdown is helping countless families build or rebuild their family altar, which you might call it the family devotion, because God is protecting his people by household. It's always been his ways of saving one, meaning to save the whole family. Blessing a person is to bless the whole family. Delivering someone, is, his, it is hard and intention to deliver the whole family. God's instruction at the first Passover is his holy lockdown and quarantine for his people to build their family altars. And those who obey not only make that ultimate plague pass over the family, they also receive of all the supernatural blessings that came with the, with the sacrifice of the Lamb, which refers to the redemptive work of our Lord Jesus. It is. And, and, so, and so right now, I want to exhort you, my beloved brethren, build the family altar. That's, that's how we make all plagues pass over the family and much more you see the much more of the of the uh, uh, the much more of the blessings just now we, we saw listed out if if you have a family but you have never had a family devotion or never had it consistently repent really and and make today a fresh start and a beginning for that i had to repent myself I'll confess to you, because in the in time past, I wasn't regular in this, especially because my ministry was one that is traveling, and whenever I was on the road, I, it just stops, you know. At the first week of May, when, when 
in that encounter when the Lord revealed to me about the, the power and efficacy of the family altar, the weightiness of those words, I shook and I trembled. And you know what? The very next day, I gathered my family, my two sons, and I apologized to them. I apologized to them and said, Daddy, have not observed this the way we should have, and I deprive you all of this blessing that God has promised upon our whole household. And I, I take the responsibility as a head of the household. And I said, from today onwards, my beloved family, we will not miss this great blessing God is wanting to give us. And God is wanting to set us up to be able to prosper through all the shakings up ahead as a whole household. I actually did that. And you know what? From them, we've never broken it again. You know, and we have been so blessed, so blessed, even in these last four months of having regular time coming together with my children, the whole family. It's, it's now becoming such a time that we look forward to. You know, and 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 to and and to have my son share with me as well as what God is speaking to him or to them. You know, it really touches me because I've never seen them so sensitive to the Lord, you know, and, and it's because of the family altar. And I really want you to, to, to enjoy this blessing with me because this is, I so believe is God's word in season right now in the midst of this COVID-19 lockdown to, to rebuild the family altar and you will see your, the faith pass on without truncation, without break, to the generation, to a thousand generation. This is the perfect time to build, and for some is to rebuild their family altar in this time of the lockdown and quarantine with your family. If you do not have uh, uh, the rest of the household with you, you're alone, in, in a, you know, you live alone, or, or you're the only believer, you know what? No worries. Join with your spiritual family together for authentic fellowship, the worship of God, praying together, eating the word, holy communion, examining the redemptive work of Christ as we do Bible study. You know, this is what God is, is His word in season for us to be protected from the plagues much more that is going to come upon the world. In fact, uh, uh, our prophetic intel tells us that the enemy is wanting to release a second, third wave already because the first wave is losing its steam. So to say they're not being able to, to ram through to achieve what they want to achieve in the power grab, and they are planning to want to release a second, third wave. You know, and we are praying against that right now, the intercessors. And I want you to know, meanwhile, God has a strategy strategy for you, his people, and that is to set up your family altar and experience God's blessing. It's like Noah, you know, it's like Noah before the judgment came. It's about the whole family. It's not about one person. It's like, in, in, because God loves your whole family. Do you know that when God, when God saves one, he's wanting to save the whole family. And that's why throughout uh, uh, biblical, biblical times till now, all right, all biblical uh, example of God's blessing and deliverance is always the whole family, you know, like, like uh, uh, Noah, as I mentioned just now, before the judgment came, well, the, the global flood, Noah was in, given instruction to build the ark and put the whole family inside. Right now, you must build your ark. The family altar is how we build the ark because the family altar centers on the Word of God. The ark is a type of, the, of Christ. Being in Christ and being shielded and protected from the plagues on the outside, the judgment that comes upon the world. Being in Christ, Christ is our shelter. All right, Christ is the Word of God. We, that's how we build the ark. We fortify our household with the Word. And this is consistent throughout the Bible. Look at uh, Abraham. When God wanted to, to, to do something mighty in Abraham's life, it was about Abraham and his whole family that God called him out. When, God, when Abraham interceded for his nephew Lot to be saved from the judgment that would come upon Sodom, what, did, what was God's response? Take him and his whole family. God wants the whole family protected. And the Lord said this to me actually recently, just two weeks ago. He says that, there's such an attack on the family. And let my, tell my people that my protection, supernatural provision and blessing comes in the context of family. Get the whole family involved. 
get them into the shelter, build the ark and bring the family into the shelter. My protection, my provision, my preservation will come to families that, because God loves a family. He created the family before he created the church. God loves your family. When God saves you, he wants to save your whole family. We know that from scripture too, right? In Acts chapter 16, verse 31, God's word through uh, a Paul and, 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 and Silas to the jailer was this. Believe in the Lord Jesus. You will be saved, you and your family. And today, uh, towards this, the end of this, this sharing, I want to pray with you over your family. I want you to join your faith with me that it is about your whole family being saved your whole family experience seeing God's uh, uh, preservation, provision, protection, His supernatural favor, compensation, transfer of wealth. It's about the whole family, making your whole family a distinction from the rest of the world. So obvious that God's hand is upon your whole household. When, when, when the calamities come upon the world, you and your whole household shall be shall be sheltered in the ark of God's word. Amen? Amen. Let's put our faith together. And so right now, I want you to, to respond. Respond to God's word by, by determining in your heart, I will begin somewhere. I will begin somewhere. Now, if you are not the parent, sometimes people ask me, but I'm the son. I'm the one who is born again. And, and, and my parents are not born again. And it begins with you. It begins with you. And whoever is born again in the family, would you come together and, and have a moment of praying together, eating the word together, and then interceding for the rest of the household who are not saved? You will see salvation come upon the rest of the family if you would hearken to the voice of the Lord and carry out His instruction with obedience. You will be blessed, you and your whole household. If you are the one who says that who, 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 your parents are born again, but you are the more mature one, well, then you start. You will be the spiritual parent in the sense of spiritual leader for this uh, family altar to take place. Just start somewhere and the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you and begin to cause your whole family to be restored into faith, into faith and be built upon the foundation of the kingdom. Because what is not of the kingdom will be shaken in the days ahead. Let your family be founded in, in the kingdom. So set up your family altar right now in the new normal. And you know what? You will live in God's supernatural blessings as a new normal. Amen? It will be the norm. It will be the norm. And this is the moment to do that. This is a moment to gather more than ever before. More than ever before. And with that, uh, I, I want to pray with us. With that, I want to pray with us about this because... It begins in the household. If you want God, if you want God to be able to shield you and bless you going forward from here, I just want you to, to know that much of this takes place in the context of family. And that's what the Lord told me. And I want to be faithful to relay this to his people. I want to tell this, shout it from the rooftop, actually, to everyone anywhere in the world that who are his people, that God loves you. God loves your whole family. And God wants to protect and save your whole family, bless your whole family. So would you take a moment right now and just close your eyes with me and, and, and come into faith with me about this matter of your whole family to be brought into the ark in the name of Jesus. Come, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we hearken to your voice and we, we, we repent before you. For, for those of us who, who have not seen value in the family devotion and have not done it. But we know, Lord, you're the God of mercy and grace and you truly love us and you love our household and you want our whole family to be, to be in the, under the shelter of the Most High, even in the days ahead, in the calamities ahead that will come upon the world. God, you want to save us you want to save a whole household. And right now, I want to join my faith with my brethren, with my brothers and sisters in Christ before you right now and say, Lord, help us restore 
the family altar. Let us, Lord, be able to gather the family together to examine the redemptive work of Christ. Let our faith be able to be passed down effectively to our children, even to our children's children, to a thousand generations. Lord, cause, Lord, the heritage of our faith be our inheritance, our greatest gift to our children and to our offspring. So, Father, we pray, Lord, that today, right here, right now, as we join our faith together, Lord, you will cause family devotion to rise up in every household listening in right now and represented in this Zoom meeting. Father, in the name of Jesus, grant us the grace, the grace to be able to, to hearken to your voice and to obey your instruction for such a time as this, such a momentous hour that, that mankind is in right now, to see the shaking of the world taking place and knowing that this is only the beginning of birth pangs. Father, we know your glorious plans for your people, plans not to harm us, but to give us a hope in the future. And your instruction is clear for us this day that we should bring our family together into the worship of God and, and, to, and, to, and to build the faith in our children's heart and our children's children too, Lord, that they may too experience your supernatural deliverance, salvation, protection, provision, and preservation. Thank you, God. I speak your blessing over every family, every family that... that that's represented here in this Zoom meeting with us, in this Shabbat service, in the name of Jesus, that this is the, a new beginning, a new beginning of seeing God's presence invade every household, every household. And Father, for those of us, Lord, who have children right now who are not walking with you, Lord, we pray for your supernatural intervention, Lord, Lord, would you intervene in their lives to draw them back to a personal and authentic walk with you. All our children and our children's children, may they, may they fall in love with Jesus afresh. May they know the glory of Yeshua. May they also be able, together with us, say, as for me and my household, we shall serve the Lord, like what Joshua of old declared. Thank you. Thank you for your blessing upon us and upon our whole household this day, that this is a new beginning, a new beginning of the invasion of your presence and glory in our family. We thank you, praise you right now. We pray all this in the unison of faith and in the name of, of Yeshua we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> thank you very much, Reverend John Ko. Yes. Yeah, it's a very timely reminder and now we need to build our family altars. Yes, yes. I want to encourage us all that that uh, we really, you know, in the prophetic circle right now, especially, you know, there is such a buzz. Really, there's such a buzz among prophetic people feeling the same sense of urgency that the world has entered into the season of really the great shaking, the global shaking. COVID-19 is just about a very small beginning very small beginning. There are far greater shaking up ahead economically, politically, you know, all kinds of situation in the world, you know, and, and this is God's word in season for his people. Gather your household together. This is so powerful. It's not just your household, even other household, be, or other believers. The gathering of the saints is very, very important in this hour because we would need this mutual encouragement. Uh, uh, and also, also, what we are hearing from the Lord, we can find affirmation with others hearing it as well. And that's why the Bible says that clearly in uh, Hebrew chapter 10, verse 25, you know, gather, gather, especially as you see the day approaching. And I really feel an urgency for that. Uh, lately, um, uh, actually about two weeks ago, uh, the Lord spoke to me about this. He said, marriage and family are under attack and many of my people are not even aware of it, you know. Uh, and so even Christian marriages are falling apart now. Right At, the, at this very moment, I'm intervening in three. You know, Christian marriage falling apart at the moment, directly and indirectly out of the COVID situation, you know. And, and, and so the family right now is, in, is under attack. And I really want to encourage you, my, my brethren, Understand that this is the word of the Lord in season. And if you hearken, you'll be so blessed. So blessed. In fact, because of this, and I, I saw this of 
uh, when what the Lord spoke to me, made me so alarmed that I say, wow, families need support. And a lot of them, because they, they've stopped going to the weekend service, they have also lost that traction with, with gathering with the saints. And, 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 and they are even more vulnerable right now. And so actually just two weeks ago, I decided just for this season of supporting believers who are going through this disorientation and disruption, you know, and, and trying to adapt to the new normal. I'm just for this season, I'm, I want to come onto the Zoom every Sunday, four o'clock, just to pray with believers, support believers who are going through this, this adapting, this adaptation process, you know. Uh, 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 so feel free to join us or right, every uh, Sunday, four o'clock in this season, just for, I'm creating a sphere for brethren to come together to support one another and to share the prophetic update, what you're hearing from the Lord, what the different ministries are downloading from the Lord that corroborates with one another. We, let's gather to, to, to pray together, share information, support one another. Yeah. Will you provide us with the link? Yes, yes. Put it uh, in the chat. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, this is a scripture, right? Uh, we should not stop gathering together with other believers as some of you are doing. Instead, we must continue to encourage each other even more as we see the day of the Lord coming. And so, uh, so this is the this is it. Uh, take note of this. All right, the meeting ID and the kingdom every Sunday for a coach in this season. I um, will just meet and then just pray with people and and share also the latest prophetic uh, information and update from different groups. You know what is happening by pressing this button below you'll be the first to be informed of any posting that I make. Shalom, goodbye.